Okay. So, um, again, welcome to our November leadership webinar for meeting the Every Student Succeeds Act Promise. Today we are going to uh, present some recommendations from myself and Dale Frost, I'm Cold State Policy Director. We are we recently published a paper with our colleagues Susan Patrick and Susan Guest that provides a framework for states who are wanting to take advantage of the new flexibilities in the Every Student Succeeds Act to advance student centered learning. Um, I, I lead our Center for Policy Advocacy, and I have spent most of my career working in the federal policy arena with uh, with uh, various aspects, actually, of the Every um, Student Succeeds Act, otherwise known as ESCA, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. So very exciting that after many, many years of trying to reauthorize this law, we finally have one on the books that we can start to create some space and that presents some real opportunities for states. Uh, we also have joining me Dale Frost, the State Policy Director for INA Cole. Dale has served as a Governor's Education Policy Advisor, worked in a state, a state legislature, and is available to work with states on uh, any technical assistance or follow-up to this webinar. So almost a year ago now, um, we we had what, uh, what President Obama termed an early Christmas present with the passage of the Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, ESSA or ESSA, was um, was passed to replace No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind was originally passed in 2001. And its authorization expired in 2007. Um, so we were actually working on a expired law for about eight years until ESSA was passed. Some of the big themes of, of ESSA were shifting power from the federal government to the states and opening up flexibility for states to redefine student success, and what do I mean by that? Well, under No Child Left Behind, success was really defined by a single measure, which was that end of year summative test score. That really just gave us a, a snapshot from one point in time based on a specific set of, of, of knowledge, content knowledge, but it didn't reflect the full extent of the skills that students will need to be successful upon graduation in college and career and in civic life. And so this opportunity to redefine student success is very exciting because now with multiple measures of accountability, states can move beyond that single test score and they can redesign the whole system around that. They, they can really use that new definition to drive um, a, a cohesive system that's aligned to a vision of student-centered learning. So this report provides specific actionable recommendations for states to transform education in K-12 through personalized and competency-based learning. Um, and taking as a whole, the recommendations in this report present a comprehensive state policy approach to supporting student-centered learning. Of course, every state is different and starting from a different different point in time. And, um, and so this is, uh, it, it will be customized and um, for for any state, some recommendations will apply, while while others uh, will not in certain states. So this is just something that um, that can be really customized to any state. Take take what you need from it. Just to level set, I know many of you 
um, are, are already working in the field looking down the participant list. Um, and, and if you'd like, go ahead and, and introduce yourself in the chat. Um, and again, feel free to ask questions. Um, let us know where you're from and what work you're doing. I just want to level set definitions. What do we mean when we're talking about personalized learning? We're really talking about tailoring learning for each student's strengths, needs, and interests. Um, and, and the big uh, important part of this is enabling student voice and choice in what, how, when, and where they learn with flexibility and support to ensure that every student can, can get to, um, can, can be successful. So when we talk about personalized learning, we're, we're not talking about computer-based learning. Um, sometimes this term is used for that. That said, personalized learning can be, be powered at scale. Uh, through the use of technology to support teachers to personalize learning for every child. Um, and then, then going through a few more terms here, competency-based education, when we talk about that, we're working from our five-part working definition um, that students advance upon demonstrated mastery. Competencies include explicit, measurable, transferable learning objectives that empower students. Um, so these, these are, uh, students know what they're expected to learn. That transparency is very empowering and creates more agency when students are allowed to uh, co-create their learning pathways towards those standards. And assessment is meaningful and a positive learning experience for students. So having assessments that are embedded in curriculum, um, that are, are project-based with, with performance, task where students can really see the connection between what they're doing and um, the, the skills they'll need to be successful. Um, it's, it's relevant to them. It's relevant to what they're learning and it's not something that, um, that is separate at the end of the year like we currently do testing. Um, and, and then the, the next part of this, that students receive timely differentiated support based on their individual learning needs. This is so important. If, if we only move students along upon demonstrated mastery with no regard to the, the differing learning needs and skills and abilities that students have, we would actually uh, increase disparity in education. So in order to stay focused on, on equity, we need to make sure that every student gets what they need when they need it. And in our, our current one size fits all system, that is not it, that it's not encouraged, um, and and ESSA provides some opportunities to move away from that. Um, and then finally, learning outcomes are are it really emphasizes application of knowledge. Um, so transferable skill, transferable knowledge, and creating knowledge. And then one final definition. So we use the word equity a lot, and we um, talk about innovation for equity. And I, I've been, uh, I, I want to get into this just because I've noticed and am becoming increasingly um, uh, aware of the fact that, that equity is, is a word and a concept that I think is important to everyone in education, and yet sometimes it seems like we're talking about different things when we say equity. And I think the, the best way that um, I, I can use to describe the way I think about equity is that equity is a means to achieving equality. So if we want all students to achieve an equal outcome, then we need to provide different support and, and different resources for them to get there. Um, and I think that's, that's an important distinction when we're talking about um, data versus uh, outcomes versus process. Um, just looking at the outcome data of a school, uh, that, that could be more reflective of the demographics of a school than what's actually going on in the school. So when we talk about equity, it's really about what we are doing to focus on student learning and meeting 
their needs. Um, so at this point, um, I'm going to hand this over to Dale, um, it, who will run through a, a additional discussion on equity. Over to you. Thank you, Maria. Um, one of the definitions that we really like uh, on equity um, comes from UNESCO, and it, it really hits on some of these ideas that, that Maria is talking about. Um, so this definition says equity in education is the means to achieving equality, and um, it intends to provide the best opportunities for students to achieve their full potential and act to address instances of disadvantage which restrict educational achievement. So well, why we really like this definition is it gets at this idea that equity is a means um, and not an end um, unto itself. So some of the specifics, second bullet point, it involves special treatment, action taken, at times to reverse the historical and social disadvantages that prevent learners from accessing and benefiting from education on equal grounds. And I really like this last point. Equity measures are not fair per se, but are implemented to ensure fairness and equality of outcome. Um, we really wanted to level set on equity before we um, get into the specifics on, on policies. Um, in our report that just came out, um, we make the point that systems of student-centered learning must be designed to increase equity, elevating the learning and readiness of all graduates, regardless of race, zip code, or circumstance. Maria already made the point that these systems could actually exacerbate inequities in the system unless these design um, uh, mechanisms and, and considerations are taken um, uh, from, from the, the outset. Um, I wanted to just give you an example of what we mean by this. Um, let's take the example of there are very well-meaning people who feel that end-of-year testing, so, uh, so every student within grade bands are taking the exact same test at the exact same time, and that will ensure equity or promote equity. Um, but the problem with this kind of thinking is that this flips this idea that, that equity is the means to, re to reaching equality. Um, there are many elements within the traditional education system where equality is actually is viewed as the means. Um, and, and, and we need to flip that on its head. Um, equity is the process. Better equality is the end goal. So in, in assessment, you may have uh, in a next generation system of assessments, students taking different assessments at different points in time, and that's perfectly okay if the systems of assessments are intentionally designed with processes to help ensure better quality of outcomes. So uh, we want you to take a moment. Um, we are curious from your work, what barriers to equity are you seeing? Um, please put them in the chat box here. We'd love to get some of your responses. This could be in policy or practice, um, similar to you know how end of year testing can actually be a barrier to, to equity. Um, any thoughts out there? So Kirsten, access to technology resources. Uh, you, you may have heard of the digital divide, especially it's getting a lot better within schools, but that still exists. But certainly for lower income students at home, that certainly exists. So the view that my tax dollars need to be going visibly toward my school and my kids, yes. Um, that, that, that is a challenge at, at times, especially when the need is greater. Awareness, all right, people are coming, things are coming in. Thank you, everybody. Mindset, um, I'm curious, uh, NDDP, uh, one, what you mean by mindset? Do you mean uh, fixed mindsets within um, school systems that prevent students from 
from approaching learning um, in an iterative way. I'm curious on that. Teacher expectations might be along the same lines. Language barriers, excellent. Uh, thanks. Uh, we appreciate that, um, Cecilia. Or, or no, sorry, Heather. Uh, thank you for the the resource. Appreciate that. Homework assignments, school year time, absolutely. A lot of fixtures of the the factory based model that we see. Okay, support from families. Oh, rural versus large schools. Interesting. Well, um, we wanted to take a moment to talk about equity and and to talk about. Um, the, the goal uh, of why we would seek to transform education systems. Um, so let's so now let's get into the report. Um, so we published uh, meeting as is promised state policy to support personalized learning to to provide specific policy recommendations on what states can do to support uh, competency education and personalized learning. Uh, to meet the needs of every student. Um, we, as we surveyed uh, different policies, we also surveyed all of INACO's members asking about the policy barriers that they faced. We uh, realized that there were really two buckets of policy issues. The Every Student Succeeds Act provides new historic flexibilities for three areas around accountability, systems of assessment, and, and teacher and school leader workforce systems. And then states have and continue to have very powerful opportunities to create personalized competency-based systems and to build new learning models infrastructure. And then the last point under continuing opportunities is to take all of these ideas and to advance a coherent system built for the long term. So we're going to go into each of these. Um, so the first one is around rethinking accountability for continuous improvement. Um, rather than accountability simply for, for labeling schools, um, and transparency is a very important function of accountability, but um, we believe that continuous improvement should be a, and is the primary purpose of a next generation systems of accountability. And Maria already talked a little bit about new definitions of student success. Going back to this idea, under No Child Left Behind, student success was really measured um, with grade level proficiency in English language arts and math. Those are very important, but we know those are not su sufficient, especially in a rapidly changing um, workforce. There are students who are in our K-12 system now who will be in jobs that haven't yet been invented. And we know that that will take both academic and non-academic skills and dispositions and knowledge that, that's much broader than can be measured by a, a single proficiency rate. And so, um, we, so this new definition of student success will drive a multiple measures accountability system that will then drive continuous improvement. So specifically, what should state leaders do? Um, first and foremost, this needs to be um, done with stakeholders, not to stakeholders. And so who are some of these uh, stakeholders that we talk about in our, in our paper? They are clearly teachers and students, parents, and school leaders. Um, but they also should be community leaders, civil rights groups, philanthropic groups, business groups. And the idea of stakeholder engagement also needs to change, um, that it's really not a one-time activity, not a check the box sort of thing, but we're talking about collaboration on a sustained and ongoing level. Um, and it's much deeper, it's more honest, and the purpose of this engagement with stakeholders is to redefine student success as we've been talking about, to clarify what are the purposes of accountability, and then to align metrics within the system, school improvement strategies, capacity building initiatives to those definitions uh, of student success. We believe that this is a fundamental lever that can 
that can change the culture within states and within school systems to, to then unleash educator potential to create these personalized learning environments. Maria, I hand it off to you. Great. Thank you so much, Dale. And you know, I just want to emphasize that what a huge shift this is from No Child Left Behind, uh, where accountability and assessment were really, uh, really came to mean the same thing. You talk about the test and you think immediately about what's going to be done with the test data, um, which in turn uh, divorces it from student learning and, and just becomes a system of carrots and sticks tied to that one test, just so much focus put, put around that test um, that became uh, a, a perverse incentive, as we all know, to focus on a, a specific group of students that stood a chance of making it to proficiency. Under EFSA, we now have a chance to decouple uh, and reclaim accountability and assessment as separate concepts that work together and that could be empowering and an engine for equity for all students. Um, and, and so uh, the, the way that Dale, I was just so struck by the way that Dale was talking about accountability. It's very different from the way we, we talked about accountability in the past and I think this is a major shift in mindset for our whole field, uh, keeping in mind that these are simply opportunities and not required by ESSA. Um, states will need to use multiple measures, but they will, uh, they, will, they will not have to use them in new ways if they choose not to do so. So it's really on states if they want to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, so, moving on to assessments. With ESSA, we have the opportunity to redesign state systems of assessments to align with student-centered learning. Um, assessment no longer has to just be of learning. It can be for learning. It can, it can serve both purposes, and states can put together systems of multiple assessments that provide multiple measures of different aspects of student learning and student progress towards the competencies they'll need to be successful. Um, so we, we feel that systems of assessment should pr uh, provide timely data to teachers to differentiate supports based on individualized learning needs. When you get a test score at the end of the year or even after the end of the year, that doesn't help students. Assessments should also measure content knowledge, application of knowledge, and important skills and dispositions. So if we're only measuring content knowledge, we're not broadening that, that definition of student success. We also want to know how students apply knowledge and um, also um, measure habits of learning. Now, keeping in mind when I talk about these things, we are decoupling assessment from accountability. We're not talking about uh, creating accountability around dispositions or non-cognitive skills. This is, this is a, 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 a new way of thinking about accountability and assessment. And then finally, this is the summative piece. Assessments should determine student progress on and mastery of standards and learning objectives. So, so it can do all these things under ESSA. Um, so we have systems of assessments, and then we have the individual assessments. So just want to go over the things that ESSA now allows. Um, so of course, summative assessments, um, assessments must provide summative information. Um, but they can also be combined with interim assessments or broken up into interim assessments. Um, so long as the interim assessments can combine into a single summative determination of proficiency, uh, we no longer have to have that single end of year test. Um, and the systems of assessments can also include formative assessments that could be used for diagnostic and continuous improvement purposes. So for example, if um, a state is 
using uh, only the, an end of year summative, they could still have an aligned um, formative uh, or progress monitoring assessment that would empower students and teachers with the information they need to know whether a student is on track and, and how much they're growing. So states can figure out how they want to take advantage of this flexibility, but it is there. Um, also of note, assessments can now include adaptive items, so we can have computer adaptive tests, and the, these items can be outside of a student's grade level. This is also a new flexibility. Um, so before, we could not actually find out where students were in their learning on the statewide assessment. Now we can. We can have, uh, we, we do need to still know whether they're grade level proficient, but we can also say where they actually are in their learning, and that's really important information. Also, assessments can now include innovative items such as performance tasks, and that those performance tasks help us measure not only content knowledge, but also application of knowledge and habits of learning and um, non-cognitive skills. So these flexibilities are available to all states. Um, if states wish to pilot uh, a, a new or innovative system of assessment in a subset of districts, they can apply for the Innovative Accountability and Assessment Demonstration Authority. That's a mouthful. I usually just talk about it as an innovative assessment pilot because that takes less time. Um, but the, um, this is really an opportunity for uh, states to build capacity around things such as common performance tests, like we're seeing in New Hampshire with their performance assessment for competency education assessment. Um, it, now that said, this isn't a free-for-all on local assessment. There are still rigorous technical quality and comparability requirements that states must meet um, with the innovative assessment pilot. And I also want to give a shout out to our friends over at KnowledgeWorks and the Center for Assessment who have put together a terrific set of resources around the innovative assessment pilot. And you can go to innovativeassessments.org for that information. All right, uh, over to you, Dale, to talk about uh, building capacity. Dale, are you on mute? Nope, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. I, I think there was a slight lag uh, in, in my connection. Um, sorry about that. So. Uh, Assessment and, and systems of assessment accountability are very important, um, but until we build educator capacity to, to create these models to implement them effectively at the local level, um, we we think that's the real opportunity to to scale personalized learning and, and change life trajectories for students. But how do we do that, and, and what are the opportunities under ESSA? Um, to, to do that. First, um, we believe that, that not only can we promote a new vision for student learning, but also for professional educator learning. Um, this graphic um, came from, from a paper that Maria and Lillian Pace from KnowledgeWorks uh, wrote a couple years ago to paint the picture for a next generation educator uh, workforce system. The, a couple of the problems with our current system um, are that um, the pieces of pre-service preparation, credentialing, professional development, evaluation are very siloed. They're separated. They're, they're also not aligned and they don't talk effectively to each other. Um, and, and the other problem with our traditional system of ed educator preparation and development is that um, many of the structures are time-based and they're not and they're not personalized. This graphic gets at the idea of um, a next generation educator workforce system that is both seamless and competency-based. So the first two pieces here, um, pre-service preparation state credentialing. Um, so uh, licensure credentialing should drive personalized learning pathways 
um, for pre-service preparation programs. Um, we think that's a key lever for policymakers. On the other side, evaluations can um, be rethought just like accountability to be around educator continuous improvement and drive personalized competency-based professional development for educators. So let's get a little more into these ideas uh, on what um, systems and state policymakers can do to move towards a system that looks like this. Um, the, so to create the seamless aligned system, um, the first thing that uh, policymakers and states can do is to engage a wide range of stakeholders and this time to develop competencies that align to the state's academic standards and reflect the skills needed for personalized competency-based learning. Uh, we all know that, that personalized learning and competency-based learning puts a lot more responsibility on students and requires a different skill set from teachers. Uh, rather than being the sage on the stage, they are the coach on the side and allowing uh, students to drive their learning much more. Um, most teacher and educator preparation programs do not effectively prepare teachers for this. Um, so by clearly defining what is expected and needed for these teachers uh, and school leaders, uh, you can then drive uh, licensure and accreditation. Um, the next thing is you can um, align teacher and leader preparation program accreditation requirements to these competencies, and that's when you'll see the real change. Um, teachers also should have multiple pathways to attaining competency-based credentials, um, and, and, and that should include the, the fourth piece, which are micro-credentials. We think micro-credentials hold um, a lot of potential uh, to, uh, to rethink the system both for um, uh, licensure as well as continuing education credits for, for professional development. For those who haven't heard of micro-credentials, Digital Promise um, has done a lot of work in this area. Um, they define a micro-credential as, as, something, as a, um, something that focuses on a single competency has a key method backed by research, requires the submission of evidence, and includes a rubric or, or scoring guide. So this is very different than, you know, the requirement that um, a teacher have 30 hours uh, of, of continuing education credit to be able to recertify under state law. Um, it's also very different than um, saying you must have um, three credits in, in classroom management or da data analysis um, uh, under the traditional system. Um, a, a key way to think about it is micro-credentials are mechanisms for competency-based learning for, my, for educators. Um, then ongoing job-embedded professional development has the potential to build capacity in educators and school leaders to transition to these new personalized models of instruction. Rather than having a one-size-fits-all approach where we bring all the teachers in to, to um, provide a, a professional development session, whether that teacher needs it, whether it applies to him or her in, in their practice, um, identifying, okay, what does this teacher need to work on? Here are the competencies that, that they need to demonstrate. Here are the resources and, and, and personalizing PD in that way. And finally, um, aligning evaluations uh, to support personalized competency-based learning, to drive that professional development, to, to provide um, continuous feedback to educators and, and that continuous improvement. So I can imagine that a policymaker looking at this might feel overwhelmed, that there are so many pieces to, to this. Um, we want to stress that states have multiple entry points and they can try a number of these very promising approaches. Uh, the bottom line is that states can do a lot now, and, and it will look different from state to state by individual context, um, to start to help educators experience the same kind of personalized competency-based learning opportunities that our students need. Um, until we, we, we start to do this, 
this is uh, uh, we can't expect true scaling of uh, student-centered learning. One of the exciting things is that even though we don't see um, a lot of this at scale at the state level yet, we do see it at the district level for those districts that have uh, transformed their learning environments to personalized learning and competency education. They have quickly come to realize that um, they need personalized learning opportunities for their teachers and to significantly upskill their workforce. Um, and, and we think that that can certainly ha happen at the state level and is starting to happen in, 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 in places around the country. We think that this is a great area of, of growth and potential for states as they try to move towards uh, the learning environments that meet the needs of every student. All right, Maria, I'll send it back to you. Maria, are you on mute? Oh, sorry about that. I was on mute. <laughs> Talking to my computer alone. Um, so yes, thank you so much, Dale. And just to wrap up this conversation on the uh, new opportunities under ESSA. So we've talked about accountability, the opportunity to re redesign accountability for continuous improvement. Um, we've talked about assessment, aligning systems of assessment to student-centered learning, um, and to support student-centered learning, and we've talked about next generation educator workforce systems to build the capacity to take on the new skills that educators and leaders will need to personalize learning at scale. Um, it, the, the opportunity that ESSA provides is uh, getting rid of the highly qualified teacher um, provision that required teachers um, to have a, a certain um, credential or degree um, it, that was based on inputs rather than actual competencies or skills. So what Dale's really talking about is the opportunity to um, rethink what it, what it means just like we're rethinking success for students, we can also rethink success for teachers. And again, this is simply something that's on the table that states can do. They don't have to do it. Um, and, and as Dale said, there are many different entry points. So now we're going to move to talking about the continuing opportunities. So what does this mean? This means that states, prior to ESSA passing, actually had quite a few um, uh, quite a few options available to them to advance personalized and competency-based learning. In fact, the reason that ESSA does provide so much space for this work is because of the work of frontline innovators that have been working over the last decade or even two decades in some places to do this work at scale and that just kept running up against these systemic barriers. So um, states have, have had, until now, many opportunities to advance competency education. Um, and, and so what we say in the report is that districts and schools can make incremental shifts to student-centered learning without state supports or policy flexibility. However, transformation at scale will uh, require alignment and synchronization of policy with innovative practice. And what that means is we don't want the federal government um, or the state government to, to mandate personalized competency-based learning. Um, what we do want is for policymakers to understand that they can open up room and flexibility for states to do this and for local leaders to do this. And what, what are we moving away from? Um, David Hood, I believe, is, is from um, New Zealand, if I'm not mistaken, Dale. Um, and he spoke about the paradigm of one. If you were at the INACOL Symposium in San Antonio two weeks ago, uh, Susan Patrick talked about this. 
with in, in her keynote in, on the opening day. So the paradigm of one is simply one teacher teaching one subject to one class of one age using one curriculum at one pace in one classroom for one hour. Um, and that actually is good for no one student. So what we are, are uh, what states have had the opportunity to do in many ways is to move away from this paradigm of one. Um, earlier this year, we published Promising State Policies for Personalized Learning, where we talked about what states are doing in this space to, uh, to create room and, and support for personalized and competency-based learning. Um, and, and so we identified a number of on-ramps um, for states, whether they're just getting started or, or scaling up. So things like innovation zones. An innovation zone is room that states create for, for schools or districts to have some freedom from regulations that may be holding them back in their ability. To, to innovate um, for student-centered learning. States can also um, establish competency-based education task forces, uh, inviting stakeholders to look at the barriers in both policy and practice and identify the solutions that need to be addressed through policy and practice and providing that feedback loop for policymakers. Uh, there are also strategies such as credit flexibility. Um, so actually, the majority of states provide some form of credit flexibility uh, that, that districts can take advantage of. Um, generally, though, it's on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, either student-by-student -student or district-by-district, -district, uh, where, where they can have the opportunity to uh, redefine a credit uh, as a unit of learning rather than a unit of time. The only state to have fully shifted away from credits as units of time is New Hampshire. Uh, then we have pilot programs. So pilot programs provide um, either funding or support in a community of practice to test out new, uh, new innovative practices, whether it's competency education or blended learning. Um, and uh, so, so we have, for example, the state of Idaho that is doing a competency-based education pilot right now with, with uh, some, some funding as well as a community of practice. And then also mul multiple pathways. Um, so students learn in a variety of contexts. The important thing is they should be able to get credentials for that learning no matter where that learning happens. Students also come to school with different skills already in their tool belt. You may have a, a second language learner that um, could get credit for their, the language that's spoken at home. Um, or a student that's, that's doing an apprenticeship or taking an online course and being able to get, get um, advanced academically towards graduation. Uh, we also have seats uh, implementing proficiency-based diplomas. So based on learning rather than seat time. And then we talked about modernizing systems of assessment. Some states, um, despite the barriers presented by No Child Left Behind, were either able to get a waiver, like we saw in New Hampshire, or they did innovative things with their state assessments that were not part of federal accountability. And we saw this in Virginia, for example. And then there are state initiatives to build local capacity even in a state that does not have um, uh, necessarily a robust system of support for, for uh, in policy, um, they, can, they can put, in, they can really, um, through sort of the human capital in a state, uh, a support district. So for example, in Arkansas, where you sort of have a patchwork of policies. So there is an innovation zone in Arkansas, um, but their accountability and assessment um, system is, is not conducive to personalized learning. But the state has really invested in capacity by opening uh, an office for innovation and education um, that has really served as a, a convener in building capacity around uh, competency-based and personalized learning. 
And then you have um, a comprehensive statewide policy approach. So a state could come together and say, we want to really be thoughtful and intentional about how we coordinate and put together our policies so that they're all working together um, to support continuous improvement of student learning. And uh, the state that we know that's doing this is Vermont. And we're hopeful that now with No Child Left Behind and adequate early progress and one size fits all interventions are behind us, the new space in ESSA, that more states will be able to take this on. Uh, the reason that, that Vermont was able to take it on was they were one of the few states that actually didn't get a waiver from No Child Left Behind, and all of their their schools were labeled as being in need of improvement. So what that did was it, it actually gave everyone some space to say, okay, well, we're all in need of improvement. We all need to be turned around. Let's all have a continuous improvement mindset um, and uh, and help each other get there collaboratively. So that's what Vermont's been able to do under those special circumstances. All right, um, let me hand this back off to Dale. Um, and as we are nearing the end of our formal presentation, we don't have a lot of time left, but please feel free to uh, put any questions you have in the chat and we'll get to them if we can. Thank you. Great, so uh, finishing up uh, the the policy issues, building new learning models infrastructure. Uh, so these are the important pieces that need to be in place so that anytime, anywhere learning and, and personalized learning um, can, can take place and fully utilize technology to scale these competency-based and personalized learning environments. In the report, we say a well-distributed statewide learning infrastructure is essential to personalized learning at scale. Um, so how do we make these things happen? Um, a lot of, of states have made great progress in this area. Um, these are important enabling structures, but they are not uh, sufficient. And that, uh, that is why these other issue areas that really uh, unleash uh, educators to use these resources well to personalize education are so crucial. So very quickly, under broadband connectivity, states can explore things like pooled purchasing agreements, statewide contracting. Um, they can look at strategies to make free or discounted broadband connectivity for economically disadvantaged students. There are very interesting things happening within districts and, and partnerships such as libraries, checking out mobile hotspots, and, and districts, parking Wi-Fi enabled buses within lower income areas. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of things that can be done to really power anytime any learning. Um, on data systems, INACL came out with a report in May about um, systems uh, requirements for IT systems to truly enable uh, uh, personalized learning. Um, we think that states can support the development of data systems aligned to personalized competency-based learning. The third one is open educational resources. Um, the, these are openly licensed, uh, uh, this is openly licensed content um, that, that is created that can be shared and can be um, uh, amended. Um, so for policies, uh, state leaders, the, the first and foremost thing they should do is to ensure that content, learning materials, professional development resources created with public funds are required to be made publicly available as open educational resources. If your state also has um, a statewide list of approved instructional materials, OER uh, can be included on that list. And then student data privacy is very important. It has been a hot topic uh, lately. We uh, see states that are taking a good governance approach to student data privacy uh, to make sure that student data is protected, but also allowing uh, for, for data to be used for uh, personalized learning. Um, uh, there are times where um, prohibitions on certain types of data and these sort of things can lead to unintended consequences. 
So if you have more questions about uh, these areas, I would uh, recommend that you look at the report and contact us and we can share uh, with you many resources on, on these. So the final piece, again, is to create a coherent system and build capacity for the long term. Um, it's difficult for state policymakers who are often on very fixed time frames to, to build something that can have legs to last for the long term. But that, uh, needs, that needs to happen. These things don't happen overnight. These are big ideas, uh, big changes uh, that, that will happen. And creating that culture in education policy is very important. Um, you, you've seen here that we've not offered any silver bullets. It's, it, but there is uh, great improvement and transformation um, that's possible, um, but, but we have to look at, at these things in a systemic and a long-term way. So our final point that we'd like to make is take this back to what's, what it's all about. We know that every child can learn and excel. Uh, we know there's so much potential that we can unlock, um, but we just need systems designed to do that. The job markets are continually changing. If we want to set up all of our students for success uh, uh, within our states, ESSA now gives us the flexibility to implement systems to make this possible. Um, so that is our presentation. Um, here's our contact information. Uh, we would love to continue the conversation with you all. Um, and if you are not a policymaker, uh, or, or staff, we would love to find ways that we can connect you with policymakers because they need to hear about the great work that you are doing um, on the ground. Um, so, uh, Maria, do do we have any questions? I'm sorry, I haven't been um, looking. I need to look through that. Um, so there's there's one one bit of feedback here uh, from John that uh, around new learning and models infrastructure um, that, that that infrastructure should actually contain a human element as well and the need for you talked about the need for human contact monitoring facilitating and mentoring um, and I just wanted to call out that we do address the need for educator and um, leader capacity in the um, modernizing um, uh, work workforce section, um, but I, I hear you also around the, the learning models infrastructure itself. So the the human capacity to um, build the the broadband networks to to leverage technology for student center learning um, to to use and create and share openly licensed content um, may require an additional skill set that um, or or different roles. So that's a great point. And I think one area that we could look at to to change the conversation on that is what Dale was talking about earlier with micro credentials. Um, what what credentials might folks in these roles around the learning infrastructure need? Um, and, and can we build micro credentials around that so that the, the right person who's in the right place at the right time would be able to to build that capacity? Um, and if I can add, uh, I, I, I absolutely agree that um, this infrastructure is uh, necessary but uh, insufficient to create these learning environments. I was in Texas testifying in front of the Senate Education Committee, which was focused on expanding broadband access, a very worthy goal. But my entire purpose of being there was to help articulate the why of broadband access to schools. That simply creating access to high-speed internet doesn't mean that models and the use of teacher time and student time and teacher and student interaction, that that doesn't change then we really miss the opportunity to use that, that infrastructure resource to its fullest potential. Great. Um, so we, we have, have we, we do have, have a question. another question. Oh, go ahead. 
Uh, so from Sean, um, success in these redesign efforts require state transformations. Um, oh, okay. I think this is a this question was divided. Do you find that district success in these redesign efforts require state transformation to be successful? Uh, Sean, that's such a great question. So, um, there are districts that have been highly successful. Um, with a competency-based model district-wide or, or school-wide in a number of schools without necessarily the full alignment of state policy. Uh, indeed, until, until ESSA passed, there was, there was no state that had the full, uh, ability to provide the, the full flexibility that, that might really enable this at scale. Um, but, you know, we have, for example, Lindsay Unified District in California. California is not a state that is known for, um, for uh, very enabling policies for personalized learning. Uh, and yet, uh, Lindsay Unified School District is, uh, is doing great things. Um, so, so I think it's a mix of both, and that's why we talk about the need to synchronize policy and practice. Uh, it's not enough for policy to require something or create room for it, um, and it's not enough for for one district to be taking it on. All students deserve to have a personalized education. All students deserve to have an education that's relevant to to their success in the future, um, and that sparks their passion, their interest, uh, that engages them, no matter what their background is. Okay, well, we have come to the end of the time. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you for, for your great questions and comments. We do encourage you to, to continue uh, to engage with us, to stay in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you, and if you're from a state, we would love to uh, help you out as you think through ESSA implementation and your state plan, so please feel free to reach out to us. Our email addresses are here on the screen. Um, and again, you can download that report, uh, meeting ESSA's promise at our website, inacol.org. And if anyone would like hard copies, please just let us know and, and we can get those, uh, we, we can get those arranged for you. So anyway, thank you so, so much for coming and we hope that you have a great afternoon.